In Hebrew, Krav Maga means contact combat. Hey! 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 Krav Maga is a fighting system that combines wrestling, boxing, judo, Muay Thai and many other martial arts. Krav Maga encourages you to avoid combat. But should combat become inevitable? Krav Maga ends it quickly. Yes, yes, yes. But where does Krav Maga come from? This question takes us to a sad chapter in human history. Anti-Semitic pogroms in Europe in the early 20th century. Fascist groups staged violent, coordinated attacks on Jewish neighborhoods and made physical danger a daily reality for many Jews. To stave off the attacks, one Jewish man started teaching self-defense. He was a champion in boxing and wrestling. His name was Emil Lichtenfeld. As Emil realized, wrestling and boxing weren't suited for the harsh, lawless nature of street fighting, especially when attackers acted in groups and employed weapons. So Emi adapted his skills to create a new system, Krav Maga. He pulled together many different techniques and created new ones with one concrete goal, to end the violent attack as quickly as possible. Emi was fortunate to leave Europe before the Holocaust and he took Krav Maga with him, which became the foundational combat system of Israel's defense forces and grew into a popular self-defense practice worldwide. And so as I look at Imi's example, I'm inspired. He took his skills and he solved the problem that he had. Today, we meet innovator Louis Plant, an electrical engineer and musician who faced a very serious problem. Louis has cystic fibrosis, a disease that causes thick mucus to build up in the lungs and damage the respiratory system. To clear the mucus, Louis underwent chest physical therapy or clapping, which is inconvenient and painful. So Louis used his skills to invent his own solution. Louis, thank you for having us. You know, this is my first time in Canada and I really can't think of a better reason to cross over the border than to come and meet someone like you. Well, if I can be the emissary of Canada, I welcome you. No, no, the honor is all ours, believe me. <laughs> it's really cool to be in your home, especially here in your shop. And it begs the question, how did you become an engineer? Well, that um, started by a passion, passion for electronics when I was eight years old. Um, I was uh, just a kid trying to follow all the other kids uh, playing soccer and baseball and, and not doing so well because of my illness, the cystic fibrosis. Um, you know, as a kid and you, you're facing and grow up and he goes and he says, well, you're not going to live up, up to your teens. Uh, it's kind of hard to take. And uh, I used electronic just to forget about all these barriers and all these mountains I would have to climb later and just focus and have fun and do my little projects and learn and learn some more. You know, I was like, like an electronic junkie. Tell us what it's like to live with this condition. Um, well, uh, you know, when, when you're faced with, uh, with a diagnostic from, from, from a doctor and, and you're such an early age, um, it makes you grow up fast because you're faced with, you know, deadly disease. You're faced with uh, seeing one of your friends going, you know, dying. I lost my, my sister at 
at the age of 11. I'm uh, so sorry to hear that. Oh, well, it's part of life. And, uh, but that part of life makes us grow. And, and as kids, we, we come to grow very, very fast because of we're facing about, like, with all these obstacles. What about treatments for the condition? There are, there are some. For example, uh, what is considered the gold standard in physiotherapy for cystic fibrosis is clapping. So it's, you know, you're just hit. On, on your chest? Yeah, yeah, you, you, get, you, you get hit on the chest. And it's, it's barbaric, it's, you know, it's medieval. <laughs> suffer from the condition and then you suffer from the treatment as well. Exactly. What did you do? Um, well, I brought my own solution. Uh, I built a device called the Frequencer. Right. You began working on the solution for yourself, yeah. you, with your own hands. Well, it was in 2002. I was down with fever, and there was this memory that was coming back to my, to my head where uh, when I was a teen, uh, I was sitting in front of a loudspeaker, and there was this, this conference, and the guy was speaking with a very low voice. Like on the radio, right? Yeah, like FM radio, probably having an equalizer with amplified low frequencies and every time that guy would be talking I would start and cough I was coughing my my lungs out <laughs> and I was disturbing him from from his speech so if he listens I'm very sorry but uh, he had to stop every time <laughs> he had to stop every time I was coughing and I was like oh no and then he looked at me you know with lasers in his eyes and say, oh, stop coughing. And then <laughs> I would stop coughing because he would have stopped talking. And then, okay, he stopped coughing. So he started talking again. I would cough again. So we went like that, like four or five times. The guy was, he was mad. So <clears throat> I moved out and uh, he continued his speech and, and everything was cool. And this memory was kind of recurrent during my fever. So I decided right there to try to use sound to move my secretion out of my lungs. So I sat there in the hospital. I drew stuff for two weeks, take notes and everything I could. And then I came back home and couldn't wait just to plug out my amps and my frequency generator and speakers and just see if there was something I could do. And what happened? Well, I found, I found a, a particular frequency that would just give me a cough like wow. crazy. And uh, it, it happened to be uh, the resonant frequency of the chest wall cavity. So uh, yeah, my chest would start to vibrate and uh, the mucus was just being loosed up from my lungs and and it was so good it was it was doing so much a good job that right there I knew that I had to bring that concept out of my basement and to bring it to the people that were suffering the, the same illness as as I am suffering feels like a story out of a movie uh, Louis. <laughs> this is, uh, I mean well, it's uh, it's uh, that's what happened, and you know we went we went from there. We went from there. Let's take a look at Louis's solution, the frequencer. Louis wanted to recreate his experience at the conference, so he developed a medical device that generates sound waves, which travel through the chest and gently vibrate the lungs loosening the mucus. This method requires no heating and allows patients to treat themselves without help from others. Above all, it's just as effective as other solutions. It's such a privilege to meet people like Louis. And it's also an opportunity to further explore the link between skills and problem solving. And for that, I want us to go to Eric Van Hippel. Eric, great to see you. Hey, Erdine, nice to see you. How are you? I'm just fine. You know, I feel so privileged to be doing this. I 
witness incredible stories. It's amazing. I mean, what you saw this time was two very serious problems very that serious. user innovators yeah. tackled successfully. Last time you saw skateboarding, which was much more lighthearted. User innovation covers the range. Lowest problem and Emil Lichtenfeld's problem, you know, both so pressing that I'm not surprised that they're solving them. You have to. Mm. Uh, there's no other way. Yeah. Fortunately for us, not all problems are like that. Mm -hmm. Then the question arises, how do you choose what problem to focus on? You will basically do a cost-benefit analysis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of the skateboarders, they were bored, <laughs> right? And the cost of innovating was low, yeah. so they did it. In the case of Amy, the problem was more gripping. Yeah. It was really something that he felt he had to solve. The problem yeah. chose him. So in your life, nothing says only heavy problems are worth solving. So think about the ones that are pressing you strongly. Are there other factors that uh, you should be thinking about? You should think about the skill set you bring to the problem. Interesting. Because really, a problem and a solution are co-formed. When I think of a problem, I tend to think of it in terms of mechanical solutions. Mm -hmm. People frame problems in different ways. Yeah, whereas a programmer would frame it in a different way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, Amy was a fighter. You know, he was a boxer and so on. He had to evolve a new method of fighting, but it was basically within the zone of skills that he knew. Now, you could see that if he was a diplomat, had diplomatic skills, he might mm -hmm. consider another solution, yeah. like how to get his community out of harm's way. Yeah. So really, the thing is that what you're trying to do is fit any of a number of skills you might have as a user innovator to any of a number of framings of the problem. And when you get a combination that works, mm -hmm. that's the one that becomes successful. But what if you care about a particular problem, Yeah. but you actually don't have the skills to solve it. You know, it happens, right? It happens. Well, you know what? If you really go through your skill set and you can't shape the problem to fit your skill set, what you might want to consider is learning a new skill that you think might fit or finding a collaborator. I mean, learning can be costly, but it can be fun. Yeah. So for instance, I know mechanical engineering. I'd have trouble writing an app but I could learn, mm -hmm. or I could ask somebody who knows how to write apps now. Is there a way for you to think, uh, when do I learn or when do I go and work with someone else? You know, rather than sitting around and thinking about it hard, start messing around. The advantage of user innovation is it is so cheap and the cost of failure therefore is so low and it's fun. So don't think too hard about it. Is this the best problem on my list? Hey, that's a good one. I think I'll give it a whirl is the right approach. Well, as the great Robert De Niro said, talent is in the choices. Okay, <laughs> good. So I think next time we're gonna meet at my house because I'm on sabbatical. Come on over there. Oh, wonderful. No teaching. Yeah. No teaching, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, let's go back and talk about this with Louis. I want to learn more about how your skills enabled you to find the right solution. Well, my knowledge of electronics is certainly the foundation of it. Also, um, you have to know that I'm a, I'm a musician, um, not by trade, but just for fun. And my understanding of how sound wave propagates um, and how to create those sound waves with my knowledge of electronics, when I mashed these up together, it gave the frequency as we know. What if you didn't have those skills? Well, you know what? The world would still be the same and the problem would still be there. And for me, as a person that I am, I would have to find the solution to that problem. And depending on my background, I would just reframe the, the problem and attack it from another perspective because that has to go down. And if I would have been 
a chemist or a biologist. I would have to come up with a new formula, a new pill that would just take care of that problem, just like I use my electronic background to take care of that problem. So you can reframe the problem through the skills that you have. If you are an electronics engineer, you can look at solutions that do that. But if you are a biologist, pursue solutions that yeah, you, use, you, they use biology. You, you can, yeah, yeah. Uh, for, from whatever point of view you are, you know, the problem is still there. But if you look at it in a certain angle, it's going to give you another solution. Okay, and, and, and not, not to be discouraged by, oh, maybe the angle is not that good. No, go ahead and try it because you never know what you're going to find. You never know what that try might solve the whole thing. Well, you are you're an inspiration. <laughs> um, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, it's amazing that you're sharing the story with us doing this uh, while waiting for your lung transplant. I hope it's you don't mind that I'm that I'm sharing this. Uh, I'm just in such admiration of um, of you and uh, will wish you a successful surgery and we just look forward to what you have next. Well, thank you very much. And uh, having people around us, me and my wife, um, that are supporting us through uh, the process of the transplant and stuff, it's, it's something that matters so much uh, to know that we have people helping out and thinking about us and, you know, uh, being there for us. And, and just by doing this, uh, and be being able to share uh, my story for me, it's it, it was one of the accomplishments I wanted to do in life. You know, you I want to if if the transplant doesn't go as planned, oh, I, 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 I want I wanted to leave a legacy, and this is part of my legacy. To, you know, if people can build up on that and go further than I did. So that's the legacy you want to let behind, you know. Power to you. Yeah. So, what did we learn here today? User innovators solve a wide range of problems. To find the right one for you to solve, do a cost-benefit analysis and try to make your problem fit your skill set. If that doesn't work, but you still need to solve a particular problem, learn a new skill or find a collaborator. But remember, both the problem shape and the skill set will morph as you proceed. So don't overthink it, just get started. Solve the problems you have the skills to solve.